Hi, everyone. I am always so excited and honored to teach God's Word with you, and so much so that I didn't even try out for this year's Olympics because I'd rather be with you than, you know, competing in Paris. Uh, I, I'm a person who loves a good checklist. I'm a checklist type of guy. So I want you to put a thumbs up or a thumbs down in the chat if you too love a good checklist. I wanna see who my people are. And, and maybe you're like me that uh, you even add something to your checklist after you've already accomplished it just so you feel the satisfaction of checking it off. And if that describes you, well, uh, we both may need some counseling. <laughs> and for those of you who don't use checklists, I made a checklist that might actually describe you. It's, it goes like this, find a pen, lose a pen, find another pen, think about making a checklist, then remember you don't like checklists, and eventually do something but not from the checklist. <laughs> and, and the great thing about checklists is that they don't need to be limited to like simply things like, these are things I have to get done. They can also apply to things like, uh, lists of what I need or lists of what's important to me or lists of like what I'm looking for. When I was a teenager, I made a list of what I wanted in a future wife because I heard someone say like, make a list of what you want in a spouse and then you should develop those same things in yourself, which I mean, if I'm honest, it was super confusing to me because as a teenager, I wasn't just thinking about character qualities in a, in a future wife, if you know what I mean. And, and, and that list was long. And in case you're wondering, my incredible wife, Kathy, of almost 40 years exceeds my juvenile list, but the list was a starting point. I, I wrote a book to men titled Seven Ways to Be Your Hero, the one your wife has been waiting for, and it's essentially a list of seven actions because I, men tend to be real practical, like, uh, you know, just tell me what I need to do so I don't have to guess. It's seven, okay, okay seven, I, I'm in. <laughs> but regardless of whether you're male, female, whatever age you are, sometimes looking at a list can actually clarify the next steps you're supposed to take. And the scripture that we're looking at today has a bit of a checklist type feel. Like we'll look closely at the three verses our elders recently chose uh, that we call the Mariner's Church verse for the year. And I know people watch this from all over the world. If you've never been to our Mariner's Church property, when you do come visit, you're gonna see things like this. You're gonna see previous church verses with all the corresponding years on them scattered throughout the Mariner's property. It really is beautiful. And as I was preparing for this sermon and thinking about this year's verse, I was thinking, you know, there's 31,000 plus verses in the Bible. Could it be possible that God's Spirit intended or guided our elders to this particular text for your spiritual growth, for your life benefit. And then if so, this is where I got excited, if so, what would it look like if thousands of people within our Mariner's family were committed to living out this scripture? And, and I, I'm telling you, that's what really got me fired up to, to teach this to you. So we're gonna take a look at Romans chapter 12, verses 10 through 12. Love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Take the lead in honoring one another. Do not lack diligence and zeal. Be fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be persistent in prayer. Now, you can see for yourself that there are a ton of verbs in these verses. And we know that verbs indicate action, which is where I got this imagery of of a checklist, now, like uh, specific actions for those of us who are Jesus followers to take. And for Paul, like many of his other epistles, he writes the book of Romans with, with both doctrine and action. And, and essentially, if you're studying Romans, the first 11 chapters are doctrine, which details like uh, how God loves you and how God helps you and how God brings us into his family. For example, if salvation were a car and you wanted to know uh, how it worked, you would lift up the hood and you'd see Romans 1 through 11, you'd be able to see the engine there, okay? Then Romans chapters 12 through 16, Paul tells us how we, how we ought to respond to this amazing love. Like, Christians, as Christians, we need to know doctrine, but we don't know doctrine just for our, our head to swell with knowledge. Rather, it's for our, our heart 
to swell with a passion that then propels us to action. Like doctrine drives decisions because ultimately what we believe should determine how we behave. And I've been teaching at Mariners for about 15 years. And one of the many things I love, I just love about Mariners Church is that it is filled with people who want to translate the learning of God's word into the living of God's way. And it's so encouraging to see. And and here in this text, we have eight, eight specific calls to action, which which actually makes this, this text very difficult to preach on and why today's sermon is gonna be just over three hours. (laughs) <laughs> Just kidding. So let's let's look at the first of these actions, which is love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Now, I don't really like how he begins this because of the words brothers and sisters. And if you have siblings, let me ask you a question: Did you love did you love them deeply when you were little and maybe immature? Like I, I'm the middle male of two females. And the technical term for that condition is, is hell, okay? Uh, here, here we are as, as littles. And I realize my younger sister looks a lot like a doll, and that's because I couldn't, I actually couldn't find a photo of one with her in it. And those of you who were born last, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like, like why do we have so many, and we have no pictures of Stacy, and we have a million of firstborn and favorite child, Noelle, okay? And then here we are as, as teenagers. And, but when I was an immature child, I didn't love them deeply. Instead, I avoided them desperately until my older sister got a driver's license and then I needed to to fake love in order to meet my transportation needs. And and as I've matured, and this is recently, I've actually grown to love them more deeply. And, And it's not a perfect love, but my maturity has been giving me a deeper love. And like one of them is more difficult to love. I'm not gonna say which, and because I'm not sure she actually knows. And Paul is suggesting that as a response as a response to God's love, that spiritual maturity actually propels us to love others deeply. But he's not talking in a universal type love when Jesus says, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. The context here in Romans is for us to have this deep love to happen actually between fellow believers, like those who are part of the Christian community, those who are in the family of God and make up the the body of Christ. Because Paul knows that the Christian life, it's not intended to be lived in isolation. Like you need other people in your life. I need others who who have the spirit of God residing within them to come alongside me and to to love me deeply and to to help me live my uh, my life out, the, the abundant life that Jesus promises. And why is this difficult? Because It's difficult because allowing others into your life to love you deeply, it can be scary. And so as a result of this fear, many of us prefer the route of what I would call individualism. You know, this is where I'm just gonna go, I'm gonna go through it alone. I mean, I enjoy people and I like being around others, but I, I really don't need them. I mean, actually, Doug, needing others, it just, it feels a little desperate. <laughs> and for those of you who are, who are watching this outside of Orange County, let me just tell you a little bit about Orange County type of people. We are the land of individuals, okay? Uh, we even named our Orange County Airport after a rugged individual by the name of John Wayne. And if you're familiar with John Wayne, you you'd never saw one of his movies where he needed a friend. <laughs> like John Wayne never said, hey, can we get together for a non-fat soy latte and just chat? I've got some things that are heavy on my heart. No, like, no way. He, he didn't need anyone. If you even look at the statue that's in the airport, he's, he's by himself. He's solo. No wife, not even his horse. I mean, he's at the airport. He doesn't even need luggage. And if, you, if you're too young to know who John Wayne is, just Google him and you'd, I mean, he talked like you'd, You'd walk this way too if you had cactus in your saddle. But here's the deal. If if you're currently not connected to other Jesus followers, where you're you're loving them deeply and they're loving you deeply, you're missing out on one of of the essential actions within the Christian life. And we want to help you. We want to help you connect with other Jesus followers so you can 
practice loving deeply. And we get, there's a lot of people that you can connect with. Like if you're a left-handed pancake flipper who hates Wheel of Fortune, there's people at Mariners and within our online community who would love to be with you and would love their time with you. you know, so many different types of people attend Mariners. Uh, if you're a, a breakdancing beekeeper who's afraid of rainbows, there are people waiting, just waiting to love and be loved. So don't live your faith out alone. Friends, get connected and we can help you find these types of, of people who, what I would call love deeply relationships. As a matter of fact, if you've never joined our online Rooted session, it begins next month and it is a great on-ramp to finding these types of relationships. And now, I, I spent more time on this section of the verse than I will on all the other actions because here's the deal. If you get this one, the other actions become, become a little easier because people will not only model these actions, they'll also help you live them out, okay? Okay, and, and the, the, the second action is take the lead in honoring one another. Now, simply put, honoring one another, it actually means to give that person high value and respect. And as a Christian, you're not, you're not to wait for others to honor you. You're to take the lead in honoring others. Like we honor people because we believe people are created in, in God's image and, and because they are brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, some translations actually read this, honor others above yourself. How about that? Like honor means that Christians were to build people up, not, not tear them down. And this is, this is a tough one for many of us because our culture around us actually excels at putting others down. But, but Christians are called, they're called to be different. So if this idea of honoring others, it's, it's, let's say it's new to you, it's, uh, it's not part of your current faith development, um, I would encourage you to start practicing honor with people in your immediate family. So if you're um, single, you might start by honoring a parent or a sibling. Again, honor says, I see high value in you, mom or dad or brother or sister, and, and I respect you and I admire you. And because of my faith in Jesus, I will put your interest before my own. And I know it's, it's totally radical and countercultural to how that you, you feel, but that's the type of difference Jesus makes in, in our lives. And if you're married, you can actually practice this by honoring your spouse. Honor is active and ongoing. Like you didn't say, hey, I honored you the day I married you. And if anything changes, I'll, I'll be sure to let you know. Okay, Marriages would be so much healthier if spouses took the lead in honoring one another. Now, Mariners, I have the privilege of speaking at our Marriage Matters event. And, and I absolutely love it. It's my most favorite place to speak. Over a thousand people come together every six weeks or so for essentially like a date night on steroids. And the next one is September 21st. So if you're local, we would love for you to join us. You love it. You'll love it. And if you're not local, maybe respond in the chat if a Marriage Matters event might be something you'd be interested in doing online. We've been dreaming about doing that for you. And anyway, one of the one of the regular themes at Marriage Matters that I say all the time is this, hey, if you're married, you married a nut job. <laughs> But your spouse married a wackadoodle. Like, your spouse is weird, and that makes marriage uh, a tad complex. Now, if you're not married, let me come to you from the future. You're going to marry a, um, a sinner. Okay, that's what marriage, one sinner marries another sinner, and then they have little sinnerlings, and life isn't perfect. Pe people are weird, right? But they don't have to be perfect to be honored. Like honoring them says, hey, I can see beyond your weirdness and, and I respect you and I value you and, I, and I'm gonna love you deeply and put your needs above my own. Okay, so take the lead in honoring. Then the next action he says is, is this, do not lack diligence in zeal. Most theologians believe this means not to be spiritually lazy and instead to be diligent and enthusiastic, not only in your relationship with Jesus, but also in your interactions with other people. Like zeal is a, 
is an inward enthusiasm for all God is and what and what he does. And, and this is a little bit of a oversimplification of the word enthusiasm, but its Greek roots are en theos, en theos, which means in God or inspired by God. Like those of us in Christ or Christ in us, there should be an element of zeal that counteracts our spiritual apathy or laziness. And then he says, be fervent in the spirit. Now, the Greek word for fervent actually means to boil, which indicates this like high level of passion that is apparent in, in the person who depends on God's indwelling spirit. Like Paul is suggesting it's bigger than excitement. I mean, lots of people get excited, but we need to be excited and then connected to the Holy Spirit. And when these two actions are combined, do not lack diligence and zeal, be fervent in the spirit. He's saying, you know, don't get spiritually lazy, be passionate because of God's presence in your life. And, and that diligence and that, that, that passion then causes you to take the next action, which is to serve the Lord. Okay? Now, the book of Romans, Romans tells us uh, that we are called to serve, but because of the Spirit of God residing within, we're not only called to serve, we're already equipped to serve. So if you're a Christian and you're not serving somewhere, you're actually missing out on one of the essential nutrients of faith development. And just like you can't build muscle without protein, serving is a primary protein to develop your faith muscle. Now, a couple weeks ago, Jared had a great message on, on serving, and he provided us with so many serving opportunities, you know, both here at the church property and online. If you didn't jump at those opportunities, um, we have new ones being presented all the time, and we, these new ones will help you flex and develop that serving muscle, okay? And again, many of these opportunities are available for you online. A couple months ago, uh, Pastor Eric announced that we're launching new churches within our Orange County region, one in Anaheim and one in Lake Forest, which is very near where I live. And when my wife heard this, she immediately whispers to me during, during his message, she says, I want us to serve there and help start the Lake Forest Church. And when I heard her say that, let's just say my first response that it lacked a little diligence and zeal. <laughs> I mean, I, I like coming, coming here to like our church property. It's just, it's really nice. If you've never been here, it's, it's super nice. We'd love for you to come sometime. It has air conditioning inside, or I can enjoy the whole service outside sitting on in what we call our lawn venue. And then I can swing by the cafe. Like we have a cafe and a bookstore. And if you come on Saturday nights, there are food trucks and then we got donuts on Sunday. <laughs> and when I come here, I don't have to set up chairs. Here's what I'm saying. I'm comfortable. Okay, bottom line, I'm really comfortable here. And on the way home, I could tell my wife, she really wants to serve at this new church. And, and, and I defended myself saying, babe, I, I already serve in a bunch of different places. And here's what she said. Okay, real calmly. Okay, but I'll be praying the Lord changes your heart. <laughs> brutal, right? Now she's convicting me like a second Holy Spirit. And by the way, a spouse who convicts me was not on my original list for a wife. But serving isn't something you check off as completed. Like, yo, I, I did that once. I don't know. It was somewhere back during the Bush administration. I don't fully remember. No, sometimes if you've stopped, you just got to find different opportunities where you find your your fit, something that taps into your, your passion and your gifting. I have a good friend, her name is Vicki, and she serves the Lord by, by helping us put on our Marriage Matters event. And she also serves in our youth ministry. And she told me she originally wanted to serve in music ministry. I mean, who doesn't? Like, music is so cool, but apparently to serve, you need to hold a tune or a note or a twang. I don't really know music that well. But in youth ministry, you just need to have a pulse. Well, I mean, you need to like teenagers. And if you don't like teenagers, don't go there because you'll lack zeal quickly. But my point is, I don't care where you serve. Just, just serve. And if we can help you find a spot where you can serve the Lord, just put that in the chat and, and somebody from our team will follow up with you immediately, okay? 
And then he gives us another action to rejoice in hope. And, and we talk about this a lot. Uh, rejoicing in, in hope is, it's an attitude of celebration. Like hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is a, is a confidence. It's a confidence in God based on his promises and his character. So where, where do you think that we as a church practice rejoicing in hope? In church, right? Like every week. This is, this is what we do here. When you join us for worship, you're part of a, a collective body of believers who, who rejoice in hope through, through singing and through digesting God's word, through the Lord's Supper, communion, through being generous with your gifts and finances. And that's what we do collectively every week. It's, it's church where we rejoice in hope. And I know based on where we are in the calendar year, we're on the verge of a, of a new school year that is gonna be filled with activities and opportunities for busyness. And I just wanna encourage you to, to make it a priority to worship every week with your brothers and sisters together as we rejoice in hope. And then Paul gives us another action, to be patient in affliction. And, and honestly, I wish Paul wouldn't have added this one. I mean, Paul, isn't, come on, isn't your list long enough I mean, this is the one, be patient in affliction, if I'm being completely honest, this is my biggest weakness, especially from Paul's list here. And I hate to admit that to you, and I'm sorry, and you deserve better in a pastor, and the real pastor will be back next week. I'm just not good at being patient in affliction. I'm better at being anxious in affliction or uh, complaining during affliction or blaming others during affliction affliction. Be patient in affliction. Now, this word affliction in the Greek, it actually refers to uh, pressure or distress or trouble. And it, it includes a wide range of difficulties from persecution to suffering. And unfortunately, being a Christian, it doesn't give you or I a free pass on pain. And, and if you're not currently in pain somewhere, if you're not currently struggling, uh, don't look in your rearview mirror because pain is is slowly approaching. You're welcome. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had my my an, semi annual checkup, and my doctor was very concerned over my my blood test results because my liver enzymes were way too high, like off the charts high, and I, I didn't even know my liver had enzymes. And he immediately sent me to the hospital for an ultrasound, like go right away, don't go home, go there. And when the hospital people saw the word stat on my paperwork, they immediately ushered me to the front of the line because in the medical world, stat means urgent or rush. But I was in the ultrasound waiting room for a few minutes. And when I was there, I, I, I didn't sing praise songs. Instead, I, I Googled high liver enzymes. And I, I see the C word. And I, whoa. And I, I went to a dark place. I began to think like, how am I gonna explain this to my kids or my grandkids? And it was a, it was a very lonely experience. I'm it's quiet, I'm anxious, I'm scared. Then when I laid down for the ultrasound, uh, the guy about to do it said, hey, Doug, I, I've heard you speak a bunch of times and I want you to know that my faith in Jesus is stronger because of you. Thank you. And I was immediately like, oh, right, right, faith. <laughs> Jesus, yeah, that's right. This, it's what I've preached for about 40 years. And it was this reawakening type of moment where I laid there thinking, Doug, you're not the only one hurting right now. Many of your brothers and sisters are in some kind of pain or fear or sorrow, or distress. Like you're, you're not alone in your affliction. That God has you. you you were never in charge of your own life anyway. That God is, it was gracious enough. Out of three million people living in Orange County, there's a believer who is an ultrasound technician who reminded you that God is big enough to use a knucklehead like you to help others. Like, he's got you. He's got you. Now, it's, it's just been a, a few weeks, so we still don't know what's going on and with my insides. The ultrasound was, was clear. Uh, but what I do know is that regardless of the outcome, I do know God is, God is good. See, I don't rejoice in hope when things are good. 
I rejoice in hope because God is good. And I know that I'm deeply loved by some brothers and sisters, and no matter what happens, I won't walk alone, and neither will you. And then finally, Paul writes, be persistent in prayer. And I'm not gonna talk about this action uh, because next week, uh, Eric's gonna return from his study break and we're gonna start a brand new series that I'm so excited about called Pray Like Jesus. And I'm gonna save this action for him because I know you're gonna join us next week, right? To be rejoicing in hope. All right, it's a long list and here's the deal with lists. Some lists lead to dead ends. Some lists leave you defeated. Some lists create guilt. And some lists just aren't complete enough. And for some of you, you have, um, you've, you've checked everything off your list for a successful life. And now you keep adding things to it because you think, man, there's, there's got to be more to life than, than this. And I would say there is. And God's word actually illuminates God's plan for, for an abundant and blessed life. You may just be reading or operating from the wrong list. And if you're watching today and, and follow Jesus is not at the very, very top of your daily list. One, I'm glad you're watching. And, and, it, and if it doesn't say follow Jesus, I would just encourage you to at least add investigate Jesus, find out more about Jesus. Then if you ever put your faith in Jesus, you know what he's gonna do? He, he will change how you view the scripture we just looked at. Where Paul's list, it, it's gonna be more like this. It's not more to do, it's actually a path to be. It's not more to do, it's a path to be, to be what you're thinking. Well, to be more like Jesus. You see, the, the faithful, fruit-filled Christian life that We've just spent the last eight weeks learning about in the book of Colossians. It's less of something you check off and more of someone you become. With the help of God's indwelling spirit, these actions, they move from feeling like they're an obligation and they move to a desire. You'll recognize it's, it's less about mastering a set of actions and, and more about following the actions of the master. That's what I want for you, and that's what I want for me. Not, not mastering a set of actions, but following the actions of the master. One of the ways we follow the actions of the master is to do what he did at the Last Supper with those he really loved deeply. On the night before his crucifixion, Jesus and his closest followers, they, they gathered in, the, in an upper room in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And, and during the Passover meal, Jesus took the bread, and he said, this is my body given for you. So right now, with a, with a posture of praise, we recognize that Jesus' body was, was broken so that we could be made whole. So let's eat this bread together, remembering the love and sacrifices of our Savior. Likewise, as we hold this cup, we remember Jesus' words when he said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. So let us drink from this cup together with, with a deep sense of gratitude for the forgiveness of our sins. Now let's worship together. Hey, I'm so glad that you joined us for our service today. And I hope and pray that God used this message to encourage you right where you are. I'd love if you hit the subscribe button because then you could get the next alert for whenever we have services and whenever we ever offer content here on YouTube. So subscribe and join us for Mariners Online.